Friends, grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The title of our sermon series, based on the Gospel of Mark, is Race to the Cross. Jesus was focused on getting there from the start. Today we find ourselves then in Mark chapter 8, the very heart of it all, the the center of it all. And it's fitting because what we're going to be talking about today in these verses is also, if you will, the very center, the very heart of the Christian faith. The cross, Jesus' cross, and ours. You see, for Jesus, it was vital that his disciples would rightly understand the true nature of his cross so that they might understand or see clearly their own. And so it's also vital for us who want to follow after Jesus, to be his disciples, that we would understand the true nature of his cross and what he did there and why he came to do that, that we will find our strength to carry whatever cross is and to see them clearly for what they are in the hands of our God as the followers of Jesus. So today's message is this. God wants to help us. He wants to help you. See your crosses clearly. In light of Christ's identity, in light of Christ's mission, in light of Christ's call, those things to help see clearly our own crosses in life. So we pick it up today in Mark chapter 8. We're going to start at verse 22. You heard this just briefly last week, but this will segue us into the, the heart of it all. It says, they came to Bethsaida, and some people brought a blind man and begged Jesus to touch him. He took the blind man by the hand and led him outside the village. When he had spit on the man's eyes and put his hands on him, Jesus asked, do you see anything? He looked up and said, I see people. They look like trees walking around. Once more, Jesus put his hands on the man's eyes. Then his eyes were opened, his sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. Jesus sent him home saying, don't even go into the village. Okay, so we hear first of all today how Jesus healed this man who couldn't see. Sounds like something happened to his eyes. He he lost his ability to see. And with this man, just... Like last week, when it was Jesus healing that man who was both deaf and mute, who couldn't speak, we see that Jesus has his own way of doing things, doesn't he? The people thought they knew what they wanted Jesus to do, but Jesus takes this man by the hand, he walks him away from the crowd, and, and he heals him. So in a, in a sense, it's all like, okay, well and good, remarkably similar to what Jesus did in, in, in the message last week, where we heard him, uh, Jesus heal that man who was, who was deaf and mute, But it's a little bit different. Because last week when Jesus healed that man, he healed him all at once. Recall, that man was given the ability to both hear and speak clearly, plainly, right away, all at once. But this guy, this is unique in all of Jesus' miracles. This guy gets healed, but not all at once. Hmm. Jesus heals him progressively in stages. At first, he, he can see, but he can't quite see clearly. His vision is a little bit fuzzy, like maybe some of you are like me. When you take your contact lenses out, you can see you might say, yeah, it looks like trees walking around. But then we heard, once more, Jesus put his hands on the man's eyes. Then his eyes were opened. His sight was restored. He saw everything clearly. So what's God teaching us here? Well, certainly that Jesus has the power to heal, right? Every miracle of Jesus demonstrates that incredible fact, that astonishing truth that that Jesus has the power to heal, that, that Jesus is no mere mortal human being. He's no mere man. He is rather the almighty God in the flesh. And he cares 
for us. We can trust him. And yet, sometimes, though, isn't it the case that we can be like that blind man in the story? In a spiritual sense, where we are maybe beginning to see things, but not yet seeing everything clearly? Here's what I mean. Do you ever find yourself sometimes looking out at what happens in the world? Or thinking about what's going on in your own life? Maybe it's a particular intense painful season of suffering in your life and it doesn't even seem like you know when it's going to end and you and you're not sure why and maybe even especially because you are a christian maybe you've just become a christian and all of a sudden you've, you've just quickly realized life now is harder than it used to be all of a sudden there's like this spiritual battle going on maybe people don't treat you the same way they they're frustrated with you things aren't happening the way you had hoped do you ever find yourself there then questioning god and Shaking your fist a little bit and saying, God, why? Why are you giving this cross to me to carry? This is hard, God. Why? Don't, don't you care? See, that's why we need Mark chapter 8 today, where God wants to help us all see your crosses clearly. Again, in light of Christ's identity, in light of Christ's mission, in light of Christ's call to follow him. So here's how it continues. Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. So they're up north, they're in Gentile country, they're away from all the Pharisees and Jewish religious leaders who were kind of out to get him, and, and the big crowds, you know, that were seeking him. He's now at the end of his three years, he's been training his disciples, teaching them, and he wants to like give them their final semester exam. So he takes them away up to Caesarea Philippi. On the way, he asked them, who do people say I am? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked. Who do you say I am? Peter answered, you are the Messiah. And then Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. Hmm. So again, recall that blind man right before Jesus healed him. He was beginning to see clearly, but he didn't see everything clearly right away, did he? And I can't help but think that's also what's happening here in a spiritual sense, isn't it? You know, the vast majority of people in Jesus' day, they, they didn't see clearly in terms of Jesus' identity. Who is Jesus? You know, people had different ideas. Some people say, oh, he's John the Baptist, come back from the dead. And it's like, well, if that was the case, why aren't you paying attention to him, you know? Or he's Elijah, or he's one of the prophets. In other words, he's a, a wise rabbi, a good teacher, maybe a prophet sent by God. And, okay, those are all somewhat high estimation. Like, you know, those are probably lofty things and all, but they're not, they're not high enough, right? You're, you're like seeing, you're like, okay, but not seeing clearly yet who is Jesus. And it's just like today, isn't it? Who is Jesus? You can get a lot of different answers to that question depending on who you ask, right? Many people, they have a high opinion of Jesus even perhaps, but the, the problem is it's usually not high enough. Jesus is not just a good, wise teacher who lived a long time ago. He's not just somebody who has great empathy, who gets us, who got us. He's not just somebody who says, be like me, make the world a more loving place. Who is Jesus? He, he is the almighty God, wrapped in human flesh and blood. He is the Messiah. If you don't believe this about Jesus, you might be seeing Jesus clearly, but not seeing him fully clearly yet. And so, to his credit now, Jesus asks his disciples that question, the all-important question, the one that all of us 
have to answer. Maybe the most important question any of us have to answer. Who do you say I am? And to his credit, Peter quickly replies, you are the Messiah. Nails it, right? He gets it right. And to his credit, like he quickly and correctly identifies that Jesus is the Messiah sent by God, promised long ago. Jesus is the fulfillment of God's ancient promises to be that Savior that he promised, the Messiah. It's a beautiful answer. In a sense, you'd say he passed his semester exam. But then what does Jesus do? This is interesting, isn't it? Very next thing, Mark tells us, Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. (laughs) So here it is again. It's just like we've been talking about in the Gospel of Mark. What's going on? Don't tell anybody about me. He warned them not to tell anybody about him. So so what's going on? It's like Peter sees clearly Jesus. You are the Messiah. He gets that right, doesn't he? But it's going to become clear in the next couple of verses that Peter doesn't yet completely see clearly what it means that Jesus is the Messiah. And the reason why he doesn't yet see this clearly is because he doesn't clearly understand the mission of God's Messiah. And so here's what happens next. Verse 31. Jesus then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed. And after three days, rise again. He spoke plainly about this. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan. He said, you do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Whoa. You can almost feel the tension, right? Peter, in his mind, he just can't imagine how his Messiah would end up being murdered. In his own mind, Peter thought, well, you know, I'm a smart guy. I, it doesn't make any sense that that should have to happen. What, what would make more sense, you know, is if the Messiah steered clear of all trouble, avoided all pain and suffering, and chose the path of popularity and fame instead. I mean, isn't that what a Messiah is for after all? I mean, just think, like what, in an election year, election season, what politician campaigns with the the promise that he's going to lose. Right? I mean, that's what Peter heard Jesus say. He he didn't pay attention all the way to the end. But that's what he heard Jesus say. Lose? No, 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 no. I'm not going to let you lose. I'm going to do whatever it takes to make sure you win. And so Peter rebukes Jesus. He thought he knew better than the Son of God. And so he rebuked him to his face. Oh, how we like to give God advice sometimes, don't we? Can't you, I can, put myself in Peter's shoes almost and and say, oh, Jesus. No, 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 Jesus. The easy path, man. That's the path you want. That's the path you should choose. Choose the, choose the pain-free path, why don't you? Choose the path where everybody likes you, agrees with you, affirms you just for the way you are, where you get everything you want, everything you feel you're just, should be coming to you, you know? Where everything goes your way all the time, where all you do is win, 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 win. That's the path, Jesus. But instead, right, Jesus rebuked Peter sternly. Get behind me, Satan. 
Can you imagine? I mean, just if I finished the sermon today and said, get behind me, Satan. To hell with you, in a sense. Right? That's pretty tough talk. Because what he's saying is for Jesus, like this was the temptation. This was like back to that time in the wilderness when Satan was there tempting Jesus. Take the easy path, Jesus. All you got to do is bow down and worship me. The whole world will be yours. Just one little compromise. Just think of yourself for once. If you are the, the son of God, don't you think your father would take better care of you than he is out here in the desert? Turn that stone into bread. What's going on? Sometimes the attack is, is overt. Sometimes it's covert, right? And here it is. So Jesus rebukes Peter because this was a temptation to only serve himself. It was a temptation ultimately to abort his mission to be the Messiah, to be the Savior that we all truly need. And so we should think about this. Satan, what does he want? He, he wants for all of us to just think about like the here and now and to think about our lives here and now as if, as if God owes us somehow. As if God owes us a life of leisure and luxury, more personal time. A life free from all problems or pain here on this earth. A life of uninterrupted health, prosperity, and home ownership. A ministry of glory. But what we really need is a Savior sent by God, not merely to set us free from all earthly suffering here and now, but a Savior willing to endure the torment of hell to set us free from all that our self-righteous pride, all that our sins have deserved from God. What we need is, is a Savior who would be willing to put aside his own comfort and his own leisure and his own time and his own desires and be willing to take all our sin and guilt and shame upon himself to the cross to pay for it in full. What we need, what we need is, is a Savior who would be willing to lose his life to give it up on the cross so that we might gain eternal life in heaven. Friends, there can be no egos at the foot of the cross. There's just grace. God's undeserved love for sinners. And so Christ's cross is vital it's vital for us because it means our forgiveness. The, the surest proof that God is indeed loving, you know, is never going to be found in your own fluctuating, fuzzy feelings, right? Do I feel like God loves me right now? Do you care, God? Does it feel like you care? Okay, what's going to happen? You're not going to be seeing things clearly, right? The surest proof that God loves us is this objective fact, which is bigger than our feelings, the fact of what he did demonstrated for all the world to see as he hung, humiliated, ashamed before the, the mocking, scorning world to demonstrate just how much, see how much God loves you. Oh, how he loves you. See him there and see him there for you. Because he must love us so. But then the last part of this is to see our own crosses then clearly, not only in light of Christ's cross, but in light of his call. So here's the last part. We want to see our crosses clearly in light of Christ's identity, Christ's mission, and Christ's call to follow him. So here's the last part of this. Then... Jesus called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, whoever wants to be my disciple, like he's saying, like, I'm not going to force anybody. It doesn't work that way. There's no coercion. There's no manipulation. There's no exploitation. Whoever wants. It's an invitation. Whoever wants to be my disciple 
must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? And let's be honest, people have forfeited their soul for a whole lot less than the whole world, right? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their, whole, for their soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. So... What can we say? Well, this isn't the part that you're going to hear on a lot of Christian TV channels and stuff like that, right? This is not what you're going to hear people like Joel Osteen preach. You're probably not going to hear a whole lot of this at whatever the, the big non denial mega church is where you can go to feel good and be affirmed and hear about the stuff that you need to do to make your life go better and, and things like that. But this is the call of Jesus. This is the heart of it all. This is the Christian life. What does it mean to follow Jesus? This is the path. This is what he says. And he says in many places, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Not ahead of him, not alongside him, but after him. What does this mean? Well, we can certainly say a few things it doesn't mean. It doesn't mean he's not just saying that we should once in a while just arbitrarily give up, give up some stuff for Lent, like, you know, I'm not going to eat meat, I'm not going to have ice cream before I go to bed, I'm not going to eat chocolate or something like that. See how religious I am, everybody? That's not what he's talking about. He's not talking about mere outward things like, fasting, although, you know, you can do that. It can be a healthy spiritual exercise. It might even have some physical health benefits. I don't know. He's saying it's not just about external things. It's, it's not just about abstaining from certain worldly pleasures. But friends, taking up one's cross means denying your own self-centered desires to get what you want, just like Jesus did for you. Taking up one's cross means refusing to make yourself and your own satisfaction the center of your life. But instead, what God wants, him making God, his word, his will, the center of it all. Doing this will, of course, always involve putting others ahead of yourself. It will always involve putting to death our own own self-centered or selfish desires. It will always involve resisting those temptations and things that threaten to come between us and our God. It even means being ready to experience or suffer ridicule for the sake of the gospel, to be insulted. Even if God were to allow it to happen, death in following him, if it means holding fast to his word and clinging to what Jesus did on his cross and knowing that at the end of this life there is an eternal glory that awaits all those who trust in him, a glory that far outweighs it all. It means we won't retaliate when insulted. We will be kind when cursed at. We will stubbornly take people's words and actions in the kindest possible way. That's hard, right? We will forgive as often as we are wronged. We will patiently seek God's strength to bear our cross for the sake of Christ. Now, here's the thing about a cross, right? A cross is always something that is incredibly, excruciatingly, painful at the time, and Jesus knows that too. 
But in the hands of our loving God, even the most painful cross that we bear for his sake becomes something that he wants to use to ultimately be beneficial to us. See, Jesus doesn't ask us to deny ourselves and take up our cross because he hates us. But precisely because he loves us. And because he went to his cross carrying our sins so that he could save our souls for eternity. He loves us so much that he promises now that he will use everything in our lives, even the most painful cross, to bring us back time and time again to see clearly once more what he did for us, his love displayed there on his cross. And to fix our hearts there and not on all the things of this world even the good things that the devil would use to snatch our souls away. But Jesus says, no one can snatch them out of my hand. And he now promises you and me, all those who trust in him. Maybe one of the most comforting promises there is, right? That in all things, God who loves you works for your ultimate good. He will work out all things, even the hard things, even the painful things, for the ultimate good that you and I might reach the ultimate goal of him bringing you home to be with him in heaven. Here's the last verse, the first verse of chapter 9, actually. And Jesus said to them, Truly I tell you, Some who are standing here will not taste death before they see that the kingdom of God has come with power. Hmm. It's not clear exactly what Jesus is referring to there, I don't think. Is he talking about his transfiguration on that mountain where he's glorified? Peter, James, and John get to see that. That's the very next thing in the Gospel of Mark. We we looked at that a couple weeks ago, maybe. Maybe in light of everything he's just said, it also could be that he's alluding to his very soon-to-come impending crucifixion and resurrection. What he had just hinted at, what he had just told them plainly, actually, that he would rise from the dead, bringing in this, this kingdom of God's grace that he would rule in our hearts, as we heard Paul in Romans 5 say that since we've been justified, we have peace with God. We've gained access into the heart of God. We stand in this house of grace in which we live. And we look ahead to the glory that is to come at at the end of the day. What Jesus is affirming for every and any and every single one of us who trust in him. Is that no matter how hard it gets in your life. Because you are a Christian. Because you are called. No matter how hard it gets. Friends, it is worth it. It is so worth it in the end to follow Jesus. It's worth it to finish the race following Christ. Because the cross is the only path that leads to seeing the glorious kingdom of God. And one day, one day we will see clearly So don't be afraid, friends, to live out your Christian identity in this world. It's who you are. It's not meant to be contained in the walls of the church, as nice as this new church is. It's meant to be lived out out there. In your home, in your workplaces, in your classrooms, in our community. And so... May we have the courage to pray as a, as a church family. Jesus, help me to follow wherever you lead. And with the humility to surrender our own plans and goals to his. Because in doing so, we step into that path that leads to this abundant life. of Knowing and experiencing God's love in all the ways that he keeps us close to him until we see him face to face in glory. And along the way, we become witnesses to the opportunities to have God pour his strength 
into our weakness. Let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, how could we ever thank you enough for being willing to set aside anything that would have been to your own comfort in order to go to the cross and there to win and secure for us your peace. Though without eyes of faith, all one could see there would be a complete loss, yet we know by faith there you won the greatest victory, which by faith now has become our victory. So, dear Lord Jesus, I pray for anyone here today who's been wondering, does God really care what What's going on in my life that you would just speak directly to their heart today and help them to walk out of here today comforted and strengthened as we all carry whatever cross you ask us to bear for the sake of the gospel that more people might ultimately follow you with us into glory. In your name we pray. Amen.